disinflation definitely, but maybe even deflation is, is the opposite, at least for the time being. Inflation is the end game. It has to be because there's no way uh, out from under the debt. But right now, people are still worried about inflation. Prices are still going up. I, I put gas in my car just like everyone else. So I'm well aware of it, eggs, bacon, you know, et cetera. But inflation has been coming down steadily since uh, June of, uh, of 2022. So uh, about seven months in a row, eight months in a row. Um, it you know, peaked then. Uh, we all know what gas prices were doing and so forth. But the reason is, is kind of interesting. And inflation, uh, nominally, prices are going up. Okay, so that's inflation. But it can come from two sources that are opposite. One is from uh, supply side shock, supply chain disruption. We saw that in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo over the Arab-Israeli war at the time. The price of oil quadrupled, et cetera. That was a supply shock. The thing about supply side inflation is it's self-negating. It burns itself out. So, you know, the old uh, saying, and it's true, the, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, when things get too expensive because of supply disruption, people can't afford them, businesses close, you get layoffs, you go into recession, and prices come down pretty quickly after that. The other source of inflation is from the demand side. And this is a completely different dynamic. We saw this in the late 70s where... Um, uh, you know, prices are going up, but people have some bargaining power. So unions are on strike. They're getting higher wages. Uh, I mean, I worked at Citibank in the in the late 70s, early 80s. They used to give us raises without asking. They just say, here, here's another $20,000, because they knew that the cost of living was going up. We would all change jobs if they didn't pay us more. So, but that, uh, that feeds on itself. So the supply side disruption tends to snuff itself out. The demand side inflation tends to feed on itself. It gets out of control. And then we saw what Paul Volcker did with interest rates in 1980, 1981, where he took them to 20%. He, he caused a recession in terms of tight monetary policy to snuff out the inflation. But otherwise, if you don't do that, that just runs away. Now, this, the inflation we saw in 2022, late 2021, 2022, it was real. It wasn't transitory the way Jay Powell said. Um, and, you know, the price of gasoline doubled, more than doubled, uh, and all the other complaints you hear, uh, you know, the filling up your Ford F-150 uh, pickup truck went from uh, $70 to $140, which for a lot of people that meant they couldn't eat or couldn't, you know, go out. It was killing demand mm -hmm. and, you know, entertainment, shopping, uh, retail, uh, a lot of other things, which again tends to snuff it out. So that has happened to, to a great extent. Starting in June uh, 2022, that was the peak, and this inflation has been coming down. Now, it's still too high. The Fed's not done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see um, at least one more interest rate hike. Um, maybe, But they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, because they, and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, the end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing, inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment's going to go up. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, we, but we've got to get inflation under control. And until we do, what's under control mean? Well, it's 2%. That's their goal. Well, it's, it's come down from 9 to 5. Nice job. But 5 still a far cry from 2. And it gets harder as you go along. Um, and they're searching for what they call the terminal rate. So the terminal rate, no one knows what the number is. Uh, I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. But, um, but the terminal rate, by definition, is it's a rate that's high enough that it brings inflation down on its own without further rate hikes. Um, because so far, they've been raising rates and inflation's been coming down. Okay, that makes sense. And they can keep raising rates and it'll come down more. But is there a level where, you know, we're, uh, we're there, now we can sit tight, the famous pause, and inflation will keep coming down? Mm -hmm. Now, you don't know, because it's not a controlled experiment. You can't, like, do it twice. But they're getting close. So whether it's five and a quarter, five and a half, remains to be seen. But that's the terminal rate. But then... Wall Street came up with this narrative, oh yeah, as soon as we're done hiking rates, they're going to cut them. Um, that, this is the famous pivot we've been hearing about for uh, over a year uh, at this point. No, as far as they're concerned, forget rate cuts in 2023, maybe mid-2024, you know, we'll get back to you on that. Um, but there's one wild card in the deck, which is, that's the Fed's plan. So I just gave you the Fed's game plan. And it's not, you know, you don't need a crystal ball, they tell you what they're going to do. All you have to do is listen, although a lot of people don't. Wall Street makes up their own version of that. Uh, but uh, but the idea of rate cuts 
following hitting the terminal rate is, well, rate cuts go down, so dividends look higher, so buy stocks. You know, Wall Street is always buy stocks. That's, the, that's always the punchline. But they might cut rates late in the year, not because it's their plan, not because they want to, but we could be in a very severe recession. Uh, and that, at which point, because the Fed's always late, to, you know, they're, they're always following the market, they never leave the market. Mm-hmm. If they've already raised, let's say they may already be at the terminal rate and not know it. Um, and so if they keep raising, which I expect they will, uh, they may throw this economy into a very severe recession, at which point they may have to cut rates, not because it's in the playbook, but because, you know, unemployment goes up to 7%. And, uh, but that gets back to the, the, the first question, Constantine, which is what's next? Disinflation may be deflation. The answer is diversification. Everyone goes, oh, we, we know that, you know, diversification. But they know the term, but they actually don't know what diversification is. And I'll give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I have 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, metals and mining. And I go, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks or equities. And they're all going to go up together or they're all going to go down together. And the more stressful the condition, the more reason you have to be concerned about it, the higher the correlation. You know, on any given day, some stocks go up and stocks go down. But when you dial the stress meter up, they all tend to move together. So that's, I don't care about your 50 stocks, your 10 sectors, that's not diversified. So what does real diversification look like? Have a sleeve of equities if you want, that's fine. I would say um, I look hard at oil, natural gas, natural resources, agriculture. Again, kind of equities that have hard assets behind them that will do well in inflationary times mm-hmm. or even in recessionary times because you need all those things uh, no matter what. Um, then a slice of real estate. You know, I wouldn't be in commercial real estate, but you know, residential real estate, um, income producing real estate, farms, etc. That's good. Um, I have a big slug of cash. And people go, well, cash doesn't have any yield. Well, lately, the yields, you can get uh, 2%, 3%, you know, on like a CD. Uh, but even in a simple um, savings account, um, you know, it, it is quite low. It's, it's kind of less than 1%. But people don't understand the value of cash in a couple of respects. Number one, in a deflationary environment, we're not there yet, but we could hit that if the recession gets bad enough. Cash could be your best performing asset. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go up in nominal terms, but it goes up in real terms. Mm -hmm. If you have 2% deflation, your cash is worth 2% more uh, in terms of purchasing power. But the the real value of cash is optionality. Mm -hmm. And this is not well understood. I shared an office with Myron Scholes uh, for six years, so I see options under the pillow, (coughs) so to speak. But uh, um, if you're the one with cash, when things First of all, um, it'll definitely preserve wealth. So if things are falling all around you, your cash will be what it's worth, unless you're in Silicon Valley Bank. It's a separate issue, but um, although they got bailed out. Uh, but so it'll preserve wealth, even if it's not a high, high performer. It'll do very well in deflation. But the real benefit is when everything else is falling apart, you're the one who can go shopping. So it's kind of an at-the-money call option on every asset class in the world. You know, Everyone's selling everything in a panic. You can bide your time, watch it go down, look for a bottom and then say, okay, now I'll, I'll buy these things down 30% or 40% or 50% from where they were. Um, some alternatives, I, um, uh, you know, I have a number of investments in uh, you know, private equity and venture type situations and yeah, they're risky uh, and they're not liquid, uh, but um, some of them will do very well, some of them have done well, so that's nice. Um, and then a slice of gold, uh, and I recommend 10% because uh, people, you know, they put words in your mouth and go, Jim Rigger says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. Not a good strategy. But 10%, yeah. The thing I would point out is that um, there are bull markets and bear markets and uh, in basically any tradable instrument or commodity or uh, I consider gold to be a form of money. But what we're really talking about when we say, you know, gold is up, what we're talking about the dollar price of gold. And I view it as a cross exchange rate. People talk about the dollar, you know, the euro dollar exchange rate. Well, there's a dollar gold exchange rate and that's the dollar price of gold. Uh, so there's just alternative forms of money where people get to express a liquidity preference or uh, a credit preference, if you will, if you're concerned about the, um, if you're losing confidence in the dollar. But the first great bull market was um, 1971 to 1980. Uh, it lasted nine years and gold went up 2,200%. Um, the second great bull market was from uh, 1999 to 2011. 
gold went up, but just a little under 700 percent. Uh, but um, in between, you had a bear market from 1980 to 1999. It was a long one, uh, you know, almost 20 years. Gold dropped from $800 to $250 at the bottom in 1999. And we had a second bear market starting in 2011. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Jim Rogers. Um, you know, Jim is one of the great commodity traders, uh, money managers of all times. And um, we were down in... Uh, Dominican Republic at the cost of the comp. This is around 2014, but you know the the bear market started in 2011, but it really fell off a cliff in 2013. So I said, Jim, you know, what, what do you think of gold? What are you doing? He goes, Well, I own it, of course, and he said, I'm not selling, but I'm not buying right here. And he said something that just hit me right between the eyes, and it, it stayed with me. And of course, he's right. He said, Gold's going to the moon, but nothing goes to the moon without a 50% correction along the way. And if you look at the high in 2011, $1,900, you know, approximately, and where was the bottom of the of the bear market? It was $1,050 on December 16, 2015. Nobody knew it was the bottom at the time. But if you look at that drop down and you, you use $250 as your base, because you know you need a base. So you had uh, basically a, uh, 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 the run from 250 to 1900 uh, was $1,750. Go down 50% from there, it's $825. 1900 minus 825 is 1075, and the bottom was 1050. So, so Jim totally stuck the landing. Like at 1050, like, okay, there's your 50% retracement. Now that's the bottom. Now it's going up, and the sky's the limit. Well, we're not overheated at all. I've got gold at, uh, I would put it at $15,000 an ounce before 2025. But as I point out, if you're going to $15,000 an ounce, you got to get to $3,000, $5,000, $7,000 $7, first. So there's plenty of room to run, plenty of room for profits. But you know, when I say things like that, I want to be clear. There's a lot of analysis behind it. I don't just pull a big number out of the air and you know for publicity because I could care less. But if you just took the average, and there are a couple ways to think about it. Just take the average of the two prior bull markets I mentioned. So 71 to 80, nine years, 2,200%. 99 to 2011, a 12-year bull market, um, about 700%. Just take the average. You don't have to go to the higher of the two or extrapolate. Just take the average of those two bull markets. You would say, okay, well, the, the next bull market is going to be a little over 10 years, and it's going to go up um, – it's going to go up 1,500 percent. So using that as your base, just take the average of the two. You say, all right, 10 years from 2015, that puts you out to 2025, and at you know 1,400 percent, it puts you at 15,000 dollars an ounce off a 1050 base. So that's just that's just history. But there are other ways to think about it. Now, um, you know, I don't know if there'll be a gold standard or not, but I do know that gold will move. The price of gold will move in the direction of where it would need to be if you're going to have a gold standard. And you know, I talked to Paul Volcker about this and, and he agreed. You, um, uh, If you just took the money supply, so just take M, M1, which is you know pretty widely accepted definition of uh, money supply. Take it for the US, the ECB, UK, Bank of Japan, and People's Bank of China. There are other entities you could include, but that's, that's about, that's over 75% of global GDP right there. Uh, divide that number by the official goal, which is about 34,000 metric tons, a little bit less, you come to $15,000 an ounce. So uh, if you're if you're going to either have a gold standard or even use gold as a reference point for money, uh, if you if you need to restore confidence in the dollar, the implied non-deflationary price is $15,000 an ounce. So what I find interesting is that if you use the just the history of the last two bull markets and average them, or if you use you know a rigorous calculation, what's the what's the implied non-deflationary price? Interestingly, they come out in the same place. I don't think they have to. They're two different methods, but they both point to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce sometime over the next three or four years. If it is a moving target. The numbers I gave you are based on current levels, but if you keep printing money, you, you need a higher price to if you want to reference gold and not cause deflation, which they don't. You're going to need a progressively higher price of gold. One thing people forget, um, you know, they tend they look at the dollar price in absolute dollars. So it went up hundred dollars an ounce, or you know, I expect before long it'll go up a thousand dollars an ounce a week. But each dollar increase is a smaller percentage increase. So people look at the dollar. Yeah, it's real money. It's nice to make the money, but you know, if you go from uh, Fourteen thousand dollars an ounce to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce. That's only a seven percent increase. I mean, that's 
they can do that in a week. So, so my point is, it's still a thousand dollars an ounce, good for the holders, but the the percentage increase gets smaller and smaller as the absolute dollar amount gets larger and larger. So, fifteen thousand dollars sounds like a big number from today's perspective, but as you go to ten, eleven, twelve, it gets to be a progressively smaller percentage increase, and therefore more likely. You really you need to see it logarithmically to see it, you know, a less hyperbolic curve. So logarithmically is the right way to think about it. But in dollar terms, the percentage increase gets to be pretty small at those levels. And uh, when I say $15,000 down, I don't think I'm stretching. I mean, could could it be $25,000, $40,000? I mean, just take my my monetary equivalent. If you use M2, and by the way, when I said, when I used M1 and did that math, that's with 40% backing, because historically 40% has been a high level of backing. If you take M2, at 100% backing, you get to 50,000 an ounce in a heartbeat. My numbers, I think, are conservative. They could be much higher. But the thing I would point out is that the, the Fed dug a hole and they can't get out of it. And I said in, uh, you know, well, all along, but certainly, you know, 2014, 2015, et cetera, as they did the taper and then they did the liftoff and then they raised rates and all that. I said the Fed is trying to get out of this. They're trying to normalize the balance sheet, trying to normalize interest rates. But I also said they won't be able to do it. And that's exactly what happened in the fourth quarter of 2018. Between October 1st and December um, uh, 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 19%. It was one point away from a bear market at that stage. And then you had the Christmas Eve massacre. And that's when Jay Powell threw in the towel. He got religion. He said, okay, first he said, we're not going to raise rates anymore. Then he said, we're on pause. Then he said, we're actually going to cut rates. And then nine months later, he said, we're going to end quantitative tightening, which was reducing the balance, the, the, the money supply. And then in September uh, 2019, they started QE4, which is the, that was before any of the, before the recession, before the depression, before the pandemic, they were already in QE4 and uh, cutting rates again. So they, they can't get out of it. Now it's worse. So they prove that the, the, the failure is manifest. They prove that they can't get out of it. Uh, and, what, and, and, and what can they do? By the way, on, on monetary theory, I mean, they say, what's the secret behind monetary? I think it's garbage, by the way. But you say, what's the secret behind it? Well, the secret behind it is if you can issue debt and collect taxes in the money that you print, you can force people to accept the money because they need the money to pay their taxes. And if they don't pay the taxes, they end up in jail. Now you can, you can, you know, get extensions or you know do whatever. But at the end of the day, if you manifestly refuse to pay your taxes, they will come and uh, and put you in jail. And and the point is, it relies on state power. It's really a neo-fascist concept. It relies on coercion, you know, the point of a gun, jails and state power to enforce the confidence in money. Now that's, and they say that. I mean, I've, I've read Stephanie Kelton, she's the bright light. I mean, this goes back a long way, but I've met her, read her books and, and uh, her book, I should say, and her articles. Uh, but they're very explicit about that. Now, I think that's completely wrong because there are so many workarounds and so many ways to get out from under that kind of state power, but they do rely on state power at the end of the day. So that's why it has this, this neo-fascist element. Powell did not say we're going to raise rates until core PC is 2%. He didn't say that. What he said was, we're going to raise rates until it's acting in a restrictive way on inflation and inflation will come down on its own because rates will be higher and high enough to cause that. At which point we will, we, the fed will pause. And then you say, well, when are you going to cut rates? He was like, the the pause could be a year. So you're talking, forget this fed pivot nonsense. I mean, you're talking 2024, if then, before they cut rates. But in the meantime, um, so they've got to get rates high enough. So they're going to go, you know, well, 75 basis points in November, December, who knows? We'll, we'll know closer to the day. It'll either be 50 or 75, you know, some talk about 50, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it's going up, probably going to go up. You know, I have the calendar for 2023. There's a meeting February 1st and another one in uh, late March, I think March 22nd. They'll probably raise up both of those. They're going to get rates up to five, five-ish. Um, at that point, they probably will have achieved the goal of bringing core PCE down, but they will also have destroyed the economy in the process. It's like I remember in, in Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to, we had to, this is uh, the latest and long string of uh, Fed blunders since uh, 1913, seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. They, they could, uh, they could uh, at least pause now 
or maybe even cut rates. If, if, if everything I said is correct, and obviously I think it is, or I wouldn't be saying it, but if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and, you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very uh, troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the, two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? You know, when I when I talked to my editor about this, you know, go back a year ago, so in November 2021, you know, every headline you looked at, website, commentary, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is breaking down. There's no, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they couldn't get cream cheese to make uh, make cheesecakes uh, at Junior's, you know, the world's, world's most famous cheesecake place. Um, you know, and on and on and on, like a, a long list. And then last spring was the, the baby formula shortage, which is actually was serious. I mean, mothers couldn't feed their children. So it was very bad. But I found some really, really interesting research that because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs because when, and I, I'm not here to debate the tariffs. I actually think the tariffs were a good idea, but that was the start of the supply chain breakdown. Because when Trump put tariffs on, started with uh, appliances, you know, washing machines, refrigerators and stuff, and then solar panels, and then, you know, technology, and then they just kept piling on. But, but you have to look at what China did in response. China, the U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now... But now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France and Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationship and they break down. It's not, it's not that it's the end of the supply chain. So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to, to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989, Soviet Union uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not gonna come back overnight. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019, and then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now, but is going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. 
And that's what's going on with the supply chain. There will be a supply chain, there always is, but the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency, you know, lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So yeah, just in time inventory, everyone knows about that, but there's something called cross docking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination the stuff never goes in the warehouse inventories are very expensive they're they're they're, they're costly to finance you got to move the stuff around it's called picking you know pick the stuff off the shelf with your i used to drive a forklift so i know a little bit about it uh you know and put it on a truck you send my trucks too so you know hey i've got seven suppliers why don't i cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two, get everything to you know Los Angeles and Seattle as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three and they got costs lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it, but they missed something. What they missed was that they're, while they were getting those unit, unit costs lower for consumers, they, there were hidden costs, and the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if you've got uh, quest docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? We need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. Wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0, um, this goes by different names. Uh, you know, Johnny Yellen called it friendshoring and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I, I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial, club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, Fr friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't U.S. driven. The U.S. is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network. You know, maybe Central Asian republics, some Southeast Asian, um, you know, suppliers and so forth. But they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually in in the United States. We won't buy their stuff, and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So, you, the world's going to break. And, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that, you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. People hear the government say, you know, the economy's fine or, you know, unemployment's near an all-time low, which is actually statistically is, is true. And they, they kind of nod and go, yeah, it's all good. And then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four you know the propaganda is um positive we can talk about that in a little more detail the reality is harsh um and reality wins um and there's a very good book um on this um by robert schiller a uh, nobel prize winning economist at yale university i'm not a huge fan of your garden variety phd economist but there are some good ones out there and he's one of them he wrote a book about oh two years ago maybe a little bit less called narrative economics uh he said yeah we got all the models and uh phillips curve and uh wealth effect and uh uh you know various you know quantity theory of money and you know some have a place some are more valuable than others but uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? 
E for exposed, are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's, it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just to something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out in reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. And he gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Then there was another period from 1933 to 1937. The 37 to 1940 part, we'll leave aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, he was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, the psychology turned 180 degrees, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Democratic campaign saw always happy days are here again, and, you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth, and all of a sudden it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still, you know, painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flip from don't spend money, it's poor form to, yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly. But they'll say, if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some, I know some of these people, it's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low. Um, it, it's, we've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, and this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. Um, so it predates the war, number one. Number two, oh, gee, energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine. It's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? 
he closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. Then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands, handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, et cetera, to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120. In, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said they shut it down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in and we lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the US has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now, that's another fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got it. We don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are pow powerful, but reality is more powerful. You know, we got through 1998, we got through the dot-com crash, we got through 2008, we got through 2020 and COVID. Uh, there's a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018 uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did, I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out, the Fed floods the zone with money, the Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example, 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day and an 11% day in uh, late October, 1929 but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October, 1929, but it bottomed in June, 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, then it rallied in 1933, 1934, the Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937, and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money, you could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, 
A lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive have, have seen anything like that. And if you say, well, what if we had another market crash right now? We'll talk about reasons why in a second. Um, why couldn't the Fed just come right back in and, you know, print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures, whoever they may be? Yeah, you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out. Why not do it again? What's the what's the big deal? Well, the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before. And that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020 pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a there is a limit. There comes a time when it's like, hey, this this bill is going to be 20 trillion. You know, sorry, that's uh, that check's too big. We're going to have to let some things fail. So what could happen? Um, the the first thing on my list is uh, we're heading for a very uh, severe recession. I just want to kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that. So the Fed's raising interest rates, we know that they started, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago, but March 1st, 2022, the Fed policy rate was zero. It was zero percent. Uh, people remember Paul Volcker, oh, Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth, and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like, practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has, all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts. And they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, and you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation's coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom-poms out, the Fed's going to cut rates, and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking, or is the inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? 
Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Pal would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it's, it's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And the, it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until uh, too, too late. By the time you realize you've it's mission accomplished you will have gone too far too long rates are going to be too high and it's not going to be a soft landing if wall street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing goldilocks scenario the pal is going to stick to his guns and, and and raise rates too high that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely very suddenly if, if the market were adjusting so yeah pal means it uh, he's going to keep it and we ought to come down a little bit that would be one thing but that's not what's happening the market's trying to rally pal's warning people what's going to happen they're not listening and it is going to happen it's going to get worse inflation's here to stay um commodities are going to boom oil prices are going to soar bonds are going to crash and gold has been in a very funny situation which is the following normally you say well if there's inflation coming why isn't the price of gold going to the moon and why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation the answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note that's our benchmark security um a lot of people look at libor but i'm like no if you're making investment decisions you're buying a house you're doing capital investing these are all 5 10 sometimes 20-year decisions the 10-year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments um well that's an alternative for august of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10-year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield to maturity on the 10-year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract but by the strength of the dollar which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10-year treasury notes but here's what has changed i talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets and i start my analysis in 1971 and i don't have to go through all, the, all that data but that's that's how i think about it and you're like well jim why 1971 why not before that and of course 1971 it was when nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth you know almost two thousand uh, dollars. You know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be you know like a five hundred dollar bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in. Bombay at the time, and it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed.
But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that $11 billion is actually worth $470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of $450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the Treasury has the gold, and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know what, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they, they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the U.S. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. 
I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're, they're propping it up, but, um, the, the, the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the, the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because, China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, Early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, it was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, the, you know, the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, but that's the only thing uh, that can come close. Even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number, but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people. The Thirty Years' War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly highly destructive. But what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things. Um, it, you know has to do with math, you know simple demographic math. Uh, the key number is 2.1. Two people have to produce 2.1 children, a man and a woman, or you can say per woman if you if you want, uh, have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant. Why not two? Why not two producing two? The answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh, adulthood and can continue the uh, repopulation of the planet, uh, if you will. But they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's uh replacement rate is uh or or birth rate is actually one. Uh it has to be two point one to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh this is a, a demographic implosion unlike anything ever seen uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself, as I was talking about inflation earlier. So uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations. But there's one really simple definition. It only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um, cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54, it's called a prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to 
be basically caretakers or caregivers for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do best. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline, and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output is coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I invest in gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U.S. and uh, Australia, if you use cyanide, to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique. You have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers, and so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious uh, wasteland, and uh, will suffer. It's it's already in a recession. Just to just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century-long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and a regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decouple from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up. And China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talk to the U.S. intelligence and military. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate stocks and, and other asset classes the largest most sophisticated biggest player real money market in the world is telling you that the fed's going to blink that they're going to raise rates but then things are going to get so bad they're going to have to cut rates and that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance I haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out and it'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up, all right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to... Uh, late 2021 it was persistent in the fall we all remember the fed and the treasury saying transitory 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 and then finally i think jay powell was testifying for congress he said it's time to retire the word transitory so that was his way of throwing in the towel and johnny yellen admitted she was mistaken also this is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession they're raising rates and inflation is coming down but what they don't know is are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it and that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening which they are they are going to over tighten probably already have it
The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really from $40 to $120 in, in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage of natural disaster. A lot of things it's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want. Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone, sooner than later pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates, inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking, and the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if uh, they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and then i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was um and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know tv set or refrigerator new car or whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects between 77 and 81. So that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, well, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That, requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. 
we're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s, saying, hey, better, better spend the money fast because it's, it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. If one of our supply chains or one of another country's supply chains that we rely on collapse, it could cause an unprecedented economic super collapse on a global scale. And that's how we could end up with this $85 trillion economic super collapse I'm predicting. $85 trillion being the value of the global economy. Because remember, our current supply chain is interconnected on a global scale. And if there is a single point of failure, the whole system is going to come collapsing down. Farming, banking, healthcare, oil and gas, tech, and so on. This isn't the first time I've warned Americans about this before. On May 11, 2020, I told my followers, the economy will not return to normal for years. There are serious constraints on supply. I issued another warning about my research on November 24, 2021. The supply chain difficulties will certainly grow worse. The remedies will take years and sometimes decades to implement. And yet another in 2022. Don't believe the happy talk about a temporary supply chain crisis. I'll say that again. The crisis will last for years with predictable negative effects on economic growth. But now things are even worse than ever before. And I fear this economic super collapse could hit American soil in the next six to 12 months. So this may be my last and final warning before it's too late. It's why I'm warning people around me it's only a matter of time before the world economy comes crashing down. Because when you talk about risk of catastrophic collapse, the risk increases with the size of scale. Look, whether you decide to listen to me today about how to prepare, whether or not you decide to get access to the information in this envelope, that's up to you. It's a free country. You can do what you want. You can even pretend you never heard me tell you any of this. But just know, Joe Biden certainly isn't going to come to your rescue. Take a look at this nine second clip from the president. When do you think things will get back to normal? When do I think things will get back to normal? But my hope is, by this time next year, we're going to be back to normal. That clip was taken over 18 months ago. It's up to you what you believe. But I can't bury my head in the sand and ignore all the facts. And the facts couldn't be more clear. So in just a moment, I'm going to explain how you can get access to this information inside the envelope as part of my super collapse preparation package. And I'm going to talk about what to do to protect and even grow your wealth. Look, please understand, it brings me no joy to say this. And I hope the worst of what I'm warning of never comes to pass. But there's only one potential solution to this crisis, and it's going to take years. Recently, I spoke to a very well-informed CEO of a major corporation, and I asked him point blank. I said, your company must be looking ahead of some possible solution. Is there anything you can share? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing he told me. He said, Jim, you have to understand that it took us 30 years to build these supply chains. We blew it up in three years, beginning in 2018, and you can't put it back together. But there is one thing we can do. It's not a quick fix, but it's our best and most sensible option. Our only way out is to build a new supply chain that eliminates the bad actors. We can't continue to allow our enemies like China or Russia or Iran to threaten consumers here on American soil. As the Wall Street Journal wrote, Russia's lengthening war with Ukraine will lead to a near doubling of inflation rates in rich countries. It's why the New York Times wrote, this is what happens when globalization breaks down. And why Barron's wrote, secure U.S. supply chains with allies and move out of China. Unfortunately, this solution could take years or even a decade to fully implement. And that CEO told me it will take at least 10 years to reconstruct the supply chains if we don't want to do it with China and globalization. But whether you realize it or not, that's the bet we're making as a nation. It's happening now. 
And when the dust settles, we're either going to have rolled out this new supply chain before a worst case scenario happens, or we're going to face whatever lies ahead from this $85 trillion economic super collapse. Now maybe you're wondering how bad things could really get. Let me answer that question with another question. Do you remember your life at the beginning of the pandemic? Despite all of our freedoms we all hold so dear, an unelected official with the ear of the president recommended immediate lockdowns. And suddenly we heard demands like shelter in place or stay at home, backed up by the threat of arrest. Large swaths of the economy ground to a halt. Looting took over our towns and cities. Because so many businesses were shut down, people were emboldened to take to the streets. But if most Americans don't have access to enough food, water, or other necessary supplies, do you really believe our streets and our businesses won't see more violence? It's why gun sales keep hitting all-time highs as more and more Americans prepare for whatever lies ahead. And while I hope the worst of what I'm warning in my urgent new book never comes to pass, I don't suggest you rely on hope to protect yourself and your family. I'm certainly not. Here's how I'm ensuring my family's well-being. First, I would suggest stocking up on essentials, just like I've done. I have a fully finished area in the basement of one of my properties, the address of which I keep totally private. It provides me with a warehousing area for months worth of canned foods and other non-perishable provisions. That's important. Don't stop with a three-day supply like the CDC recommends. Make sure you have enough water, basic food, and toiletries to last at least three months. And keep them in a safe area where they can sit without damage or spoiling. I would also recommend buying several large capacity freezers. I already have three and I may continue purchasing more. If you have the means, consider installing alternate energy solutions in case of a worst case scenario. I've already installed the largest non-commercial solar power system in New England on my property. If you can, have alternative sources of power generation on your property. I've also dug three wells, planted abundant gardens, and built a significant greenhouse. But whatever you decide, do recognize that none of it will matter if you're not getting accurate information about what to expect in the coming days. Like I said, to be able to make the right decisions during a crisis, you need to lean on someone. So if that's not me, you should find another well-connected person you can trust, ideally someone who's previously held a position of power in our government. But if you want to learn what's inside this envelope and see what I know, right now is your chance. See, I've gone ahead and published this information I'm holding here in this envelope inside my newest book. It has brand new proof of the unfolding situation and inside level details on how it will play out. Urgent preparation report number one. Buy this asset after securing your family's food and energy. As the economy collapses and the shelves are bare, the government will respond by printing even more money. When it does, the value of the dollar will be destroyed through inflation. But 5,000 years of history proves that one item, gold, outlasts every other currency as a form of money. And I believe that economic collapse occurring right now will send gold skyrocketing over the next six months. That's why I'll send you my urgent report called The Perfect Physical Gold Portfolio. Everything you need to know about buying the right kind of physical gold as part of my super collapse preparation package. You'll find everything you need to know about investing in gold before the price blasts through the ceiling, including, is gold safe to invest in? How much should I invest in precious metals? What metals should I buy and what should I avoid? What are the best places to buy gold and other precious metals? What are the safest ways to store gold to avoid theft or government confiscation? And much more. Plus, I'll also send you urgent preparation report number two, my Biden Bucks protection plan. I haven't mentioned it yet, but during my research, I came across a troubling executive order that President Biden just signed. See, every time there's an economic crisis, the government responds with massive new programs to try and control the economy and its citizens. In 2008, it was bailouts of big banks and new government agencies to regulate the financial industry. This time, it will be much worse. I've uncovered a plan for U.S. government cryptocurrency I call Biden Bucks, that I believe the government will unveil during this economic collapse to control your money and manage the societal fallout. By the time this program is announced, it will be nearly impossible for everyday Americans like you to protect their wealth and keep their privacy, which is why I've created another urgent report to get you prepared ahead of time. Inside this new report, you'll get step-by-step -step details on what these Biden bucks are, why they'll be used during this collapse, and how to outsmart this sinister program. By creating one, an off-the-grid fortune, Secure $1.1 million in wealth inside a soda can safe. Two, saving your freedoms. Have liquidity and spendable wealth without using Biden bucks. And three, growing your personal wealth. You'll get possible investment upside as events unfold. 
And four, ensuring you maintain your wealth regardless of external conditions. Building your own off-the-grid portfolio now will protect you from the government surveillance state coming during the economic super collapse. Biden bucks testing is underway. The digital dollar could be rolled out soon. Before it's too late, make sure to protect yourself and your retirement savings. You'll find everything you need in this urgent report as part of my super collapse preparation package. But that's not all, because you'll also get urgent preparation report number three, secure this secret off the grid asset. You see, I've learned of another little appreciated asset that's a liquid form of wealth. It can't be tracked or traced. It's completely legal and easy to find if you know where to look. Over time, its value has steadily grown, but very few people know anything about its investment potential. You're about to be one of the few. I believe you must include this secret asset in any off-the-grid portfolio.